be on camera, that's totally fine. If uh, people who, uh, if you have questions along the way, you can enter it in the chat. That might be the easiest thing. Um, certainly you could raise your hand and ask a question. Um, so like I said, we have three presenters and Katie's gonna kick us off with um, telling us about uh, some, what do college admissions counselors look for when students are applying um, at Siena and specifically for uh, certain majors and any, you know, any other highlights that uh, students and parents really should know. So go ahead, Katie. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Karen. And it's so great to be here to speak with you tonight. Everyone's in their warm, cozy houses, staying warm, which is fantastic. Um, as Karen mentioned, my name is Katie. I do work at Siena. I'm a Siena graduate. I've been at the college going on 20 years now, which is crazy to think of how fast time flies when you're having fun. Uh, but I got to tell you, if you ask me and Janae and Steve, I bet you we're all going to say doing these types of sessions with families are some of the favorite things that we do. Um, you are about to embark on a super exciting journey, the college search process. And I think right now, if we were in person and we have the ability to ask you, um, how are you feeling? Uh, we're probably going to hear a lot of emotions. We're going to hear excitement. We're going to hear stress. We're going to hear anxiety. We're going to hear overwhelm. We're going to hear nervousness. We're going to hear all those emotions, which are all 100% normal. Um, know that you aren't alone, um, but know that this is an exciting time for you to really get out there and start the college search process. So as juniors, you have all the opportunity in the world right now in the palm of your hands. When it comes to, and Janae's smiling because she knows what I'm thinking, when it comes to applying to colleges, there's kind of seven key elements to an application. And whether you're looking at private schools, state public schools, whether you're looking at community colleges, um, that heart of that application is going to be that transcript. Um, and that transcript tells us that academic story. It tells us the story of your four-year high school journey. It tells us the classes you've enrolled in. It tells us the rigor of the classes you've taken. And most importantly, it tells us how you've performed academically in those classes. So as you're sitting there watching tonight, and I bet pretty soon, um, you're gonna be meeting with your, your, your school counselor to determine your senior year schedule. What's really important is to continue to challenge yourself next year as a senior. So if you're thinking those business majors, if you're thinking those science majors, love me, support me, but stick with the math. Take a fourth year math. Janae's smiling, she's agreeing with me. If you're thinking a science major, if you're thinking you got to stick with the science, so pre-calc, stats, physics, whatever that science is, you got to continue to challenge yourself. That's only going to put you in the best possible spot possible when applying to these colleges, making yourself the most competitive applicant that you can be. Look at your transcript. Have a conversation with your family. Have a conversation with your school counselor. And you want to make sure you're doing well. Am I saying all A's? No. Am I saying all A's and B's? No. The C's and D's happen. Totally get that. Um, but you want to make sure you're doing classes where you're academically challenged, but you're also successful in them. So it's really important to look at the rigor of the classes you're taking. If you're in the, if you're in regions level, college prep standard, and you're getting A's and B's, awesome. Keep up the great work but maybe you wanna throw in an honors to challenge yourself, or maybe you wanna throw in an AP to challenge yourself. But if you're in that full AP curriculum and you're getting those C's and D's, you may wanna take a step back as well and, and, and maybe not challenge yourself as much and step down a little bit. So junior year matters as does senior year. So know that as you begin senior year, senior year grades and courses matter just as much as freshman through junior year. So the heart of the application is that transcript for sure. As we look in the world of silver lines, linings, and I think COVID has taught us we've got to look for silver linings, right? We've got to find find good after coming out of this or, and still in this pandemic. Um, one of the big ones, and Sienna has been going on eight years now, are those SATs and ACTs being optional. And so as you know, as you're starting this process, so many schools are now test optional, uh, meaning that you don't have to submit your test scores to apply to that college. Um, Sienna is one of them. Many private schools are. Janae is going to talk about SUNY Binghamton and the SUNY systems in terms of the test scores. But for us, when you apply to Sienna, you don't even have to, or any test option school, you don't even submit those SATs or ACT scores. That heart of that application is going to be your transcript. Now, I think it's good for everyone to take at least one SAT or ACT just to have a score under your belt 
as you go through this application process, uh, you may learn some of the schools and maybe a specific program you wanna to apply to does require an SAT or an ACT. Maybe schools require it for financial aid or need base. And Steve will talk a little bit about that. So it's always good to have a, a test score under your belt. And again, work with your school counselor to determine that best time um, to take that test score. But we know there's some tests coming up in March. There's some in the spring. So you certainly have some time to be able to take those test scores. Another key component, um, and I think it's actually the hardest part of the application for students, um, is that essay. And I think why the essay, and if you talk to your friends who are seniors now, I know Steve's daughter just went through it. If you talk to your students who um, are friends who are seniors now, everything in the application is kind of done for you. You've done the transcript. You're just continuing to build on it. Letters of recommendation are going to be written for you. You have to do the ask, but they're going to be written for you. Extracurricular activities and involvements you've been doing, you're continuing. But the essay is the one part that you need to sit down and kind of start from scratch. So I tell you now as a junior, as you're about to embark into your spring semester of junior year, you're going to have an amazing summer entering your senior year. Start to keep mental note of cool things that happen along the way. What do I mean by that? You read a great book. You met someone that taught you a really cool lesson. You read a quote that had a big impact on you. You took an amazing summer vacation with your family and you have so many awesome memories of it. The list continues. Keep track of those, whether it's on your phone and a notes page, whether it's in a Google document, whether it's on a piece of paper. And that's such a good starting point as you start to think about that college essay topic that you are going to write. Why the essay is so important in the admissions process is that it's unique to you. So there's no essays that are alike. And an application is this. It's a computer screen, right? And there's two ways to bring personality to your application. The first is that essay. And then the second is through demonstrated interest. And we can talk about that um, later on in the evening. But I tell you about the essay because I think it's so important to pick a topic that you're excited to write about, a topic that you want to write about. And I bet Janae and Steve will agree with me that the best essays that we read are sometimes the simplest essays. It doesn't have to be profound. It doesn't have to be complex. We simply want to learn about you. Um, for some, one student this year was a chocolate chip cookie recipe. For another student that I read, his was about being extremely tall and the view he has from dust on the top of bookshelves to seeing people's hair out of place, right, so for being tall. Cute, but unique to him. So the essay is, is going to be important. And I tell you that now as a junior because you can start to think about what you may want to write about as you start to get into your senior year. I wanna to touch on something uh, also that I think is really important, um, that's demonstrated interest. And so when we say demonstrated interest, we don't mean major, um, although your major is certainly a big part of the search process, but demonstrated interest is, is showing that you're interested in a college. And another silver lining of this pandemic is there, there are so many ways that you can raise your hand and say, hey, Janae, I'm interested in Binghamton. Hey, Steve, I'm interested in the College of St. Rose. Hey, Katie, I'm interested in Siena. And colleges track all of that. So as you start this journey, make sure you're making connections with the admissions team, letting them know that you're on their campus, whether it's for a tour, whether it's for an open house, whether it's for an information session, whether it's for a virtual tour. Go on all of our websites. We all have virtual options. Silver lining number two of this pandemic being able to do things like this virtually, yet still learning about the college. And all of those are forms of demonstrated interest. College fairs, I know there's one at Gilderland, there's one at Hudson Valley. All of those are ways to show interest in college. Uh, so as you're starting to navigate this process, make sure you raise your hand and you tell the schools that you're interested in them, that you are interested in them. February break is coming up. Start in your backyard. Come visit me at Siena. Go visit RPI, go visit Steve at St. Rose, go visit my friend Marcia over at SUNY Albany. All of us are very different and unique types of campuses, but in the backyard it gives you a feel for what makes you comfortable, where you see yourself, and from there, build your college list. So February break, start doing some of those college visits if you haven't, and those visits are really going to help you determine what types of schools uh, you are the most comfortable at. And then the last, the last piece, and, and I don't want to go too long, Karen. I know I want to open it to question and answers. And Janae and Steve, of course, um, is is those letter are those letters of recommendation? Um, those are really powerful pieces of your application as well. Um, your school counselor, you guys are blessed with Gilderland, the best school counselors. They write personal, they write unique 
letters of recommendation about you, the student, and your teachers write amazing ones. So right now, as you're sitting there as juniors, think about those teachers, those coaches, those mentors, those bosses, um, advisors that know you and know you well. And sometimes the best letters of recommendations are from teachers who don't give you straight A's. Sometimes it's a teacher who you maybe got a B minus or a C because you worked so, so hard and you passed that class. So start to think about it now as juniors, because I have a feeling, Karen, Candace, Ashley, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think you like to have them give an idea, maybe the end of the year as they're going into summer, um, who those teachers are that they may want to ask in, in terms of letters of recommendation. So being prepared in terms of, of who those teachers are, are only going to help take that stress off of you. I'll stop there. I know I can keep going on, but I don't want to go too long. If anybody has any questions and wants to put them in the chat or raise their hand, we can call on you if you have any questions. Emily asks if you can get letters of recommendation from retired teachers, and absolutely you can. Um, we get letters of recommendations from retired teachers. I see them from bosses at jobs. I see them from um, mentors. I see them from advisors, from priests. Um, letters of recommendation truly can be from everyone and anyone. Um, it's talking about the student academically and then personally how they are in the community. Yeah. And sometimes, and, and I didn't mention it, but I know this is a, a big one, those activities and involvements are super important, right? Colleges want students who are active and involved. We want students who are going to come to our college and be successful in the classroom, but also outside of the classroom. College is so much different than high school. There's so much more free time, which you got to fill up your time with clubs, activities, and things that you love to do. So as you start to go into senior year, I always say it's quality, not quantity. Keep sticking with what you're doing, whether it's sports, whether it's theater, whether it's music, whether it's volunteer, whether it's helping with younger siblings, guess what? That's an extracurricular activity. Whether it's helping with grandparents, whether it's service, there's so many things that colleges like to see and extracurricular activities look different for everyone, um, for everyone. I thought I'd just raise my hand just to... <laughs> I wasn't going to chat. So Katie, um, we we have students who are thinking about setting, and, and this is for you too, Janae, as well. Um, but students are going to be setting up visits. And some, you know, initially they've never done this before. So what, you know, what's the easiest way for a student to um, schedule a visit or parents? Well, I'd like students to schedule the visits, but we know parents aren't involved too, because they're the ones typically driving the student <laughs> to the campus. Yeah. I think the websites are the easiest, right, Janae? You'd agree with me. I was completely going to suggest that, and the students can do it. And no one, it doesn't really matter if it's the students or the parents. Whoever whoever signs up, it's perfectly fine. Um, just make sure that we're capturing the information that it, the email address that you want us to communicate with. Um, if it's your parents and it's their work one, they may not appreciate all the messages and things. So make sure the student has a, a message or an email that they want to use for colleges. So it looks like there's another question here. When writing a college essay, does the topic have to be something, be about something that happened um, in high school or, or any at any point? I think it could be at any point. And I think for every student, you're going to know what that right topic is. Um, most students talk to family members, talk to teachers, school counselors about their topic to vet it out and make sure um, it's the right topic. But um, I've read essays and I just read one yesterday about um, a medical condition of a student that was diagnosed in second grade and the impacts from second grade to now. Um, so truly, it can be anything. What's so unique about the essay, it's about you. So there is no timeline that it has to be within. Would you agree, Janae? I would agree. Yes, completely. Um, and I, I think that, you know, it's really coming out in the genuine voice of the student, I think is really beneficial. I do read some essays and I've seen where They've been influenced, I think, by um, the voice of a, of a parent is very different than the voice of a student. And so an 18-year-old, in, in the terms of the way that they think, is going to come across differently than what parents would say. And it, it um, a lot of times we read into the essays in that concept, and it's something that we see. Um, we really do appreciate and want to see that student voice coming through. So we have a couple of questions. Um, I see we have a hand raised, but we'll just answer quickly. How many um, uh, letters of recommendation are typically required for uh, applications? 
Yeah, and I think for every school that's going to be different. I think that magic number shouldn't go above three total. I think there can be too many letters, and at some point you got to think about making sure each letter is telling us something different. Um, so for Sienna, the school counselor letter of recommendation is required, and then typically we get one or two additional letters of recommendation. So for Binghamton, we are only looking at one letter of recommendation. So that can be from the school counselor or it can be from a teacher. Um, we do ask that it be someone academic is the only requirement that we have at Binghamton. And then within SUNY, there are, again, like Katie said, each campus is different. Um, so you need to check with the individual campus to see what they require. Some may not require any for that matter. So when you start this process, I think it's so important, like organization, I think is the key to this game. Um, and when it comes to organization, I think the most important thing, and Janae mentioned this, was about the email that you wanna use to be communicated to. Make sure it's a professional email. Um, there have been many emails I've read that I'm so professional. Katiezalza at gmail.com. Janae Norris at gmail.com. Professional email that you use for this college process. And then within your email, create folders, folders for the various colleges. I'm sure the floodgates have already started to open um, in terms of college emails. And so use folders to keep your messages organized. Maybe you have folders for the colleges that you're really interested in. And then an other folder for those that you're not sure, but you want to keep the information. Um, that's just going to help you in terms of the organization side of things and knowing what the colleges need as well. Okay, great. So thank you, uh, Katie. Um, we want to maybe do a transition over to Janae and um, have her start sharing about the SUNY system. But before you do, I just want to say um, the counselors are inviting parents and students in. We just started. So uh, a lot of the topics that we're talking about tonight, we will uh, speak specifically in our junior conferences, but it's nice to hear from college folks what you're looking for because you have a, a different viewpoint, you know, and, and you say things maybe in a different way sometimes than we do. So, um, but just, you know, and if, as junior conferences come up, the, you know, we're, uh, you, you can ask those questions when we see you in person. So, okay. All right, Janae, take it away. All right. And I do have a presentation. So I'm actually just going to pull that up real quick. I'm hoping you can. Are you seeing a from the beginning a, a picture of Binghamton University right now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So you're seeing SUNY system overview. And I know I was asked to talk a little bit about the the SUNY system in general. Um, and I, I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to try and make sure that I keep it brief and succinct in terms of what I'm covering and that sort of thing. Um, SUNY as a system as a whole has 64 different campuses, um, and there's actually some different opportunities for students, whether it be the two-year community colleges and two-year colleges that are out there and available to the technology colleges, the university colleges, and um, the university centers. So I mean, there's a lot of options in different institutions. Um, SUNY really tries to have a campus for everyone in New York. Um, when you look at the different community colleges, they are open enrollment. Um, that being said, they're very much designed where students can take those and transfer them out um, into the to four-year programs very easily. Um, and we have the transfer pathways to help make and facilitate that for students and families. So you'll know in advance of what courses will transfer in. Um, we have some really great resources in SUNY to let students know in advance. SUNY Community Colleges are also have outstanding programs that prepare students right away for the workforce. So um, if you're looking to become a nurse, a registered nurse, there's an associate's degree programs in that. Um, and they, they do extremely well in preparing students for their careers in their field. Dental hygiene, um, engineering technologies, those programs are, are designed where you can get right out and get working after your associate's degree. So, and we know there's different types of students, different options and, and um, opportunities. Many of the community colleges also will have some honors programs for students that are challenging themselves in high school and want to continue with that. So they, they're still able to um, be at an affordable option, remain at home if that's um, easier. Um, and there are some nuanced and specialized programs. So like if you look at FIT, that is part of the, the SUNY community college system. But they also have some very unique programs in FIT, and they are very competitive to get into, um, as well as leading up to bachelor's or master's at that program. Techno technology colleges um, really have hands-on type programs. They're excellent for supporting students 
um, really designed in terms of the internships and on the job training for students. Um, they have really great opportunities and some very unique options and opportunities as well. So SUNY Maritime is a program where if you want to um, become a, a commercial um, shipper um, and, and be a captain, you can uh, pursue that program. And so there are some really unique nuances and, and programs and opportunities at our technology colleges in SUNY. Um, the university colleges have uh, bachelors as, as well as masters. Some of these have, have just recently had name grade, grade changes. So um, I know that Oswego now is Oswego university, State University College. Um, so they've, they're going through some enhancements at, at those campuses as well. Um, there are a lot of different opportunities for students, different academics um, that are available for students. Um, many of these in, you know, families may think of them as the teaching colleges. They have a lot of education programs, but they also have other academics that they offer as well. Um, and then you have the university centers and the specialized degree programs. Um, within these, you are going from bachelor's all the way through doctoral programs, really um, unique opportunities, undergraduate research, as well as renowned faculty um, in, in both nationally and international faculty that are at these campuses. So there's a lot of different opportunities in SUNY um, that are available for students. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as far as the admissions requirements, every campus is gonna somewhat vary in what they're looking for. Um, most campuses now are using both the SUNY and the Common application. Some are um, including and doing the coalition. So you just need to check on the website. Campuses in SUNY do not care which application you use. Um, it's really your choice and preference is what's easier for you to use and apply for. Um, as stated, really the official transcript is the first and foremost thing that most campuses are gonna be looking at and looking at the trends and things that are on your transcript. That letter of recommendation is gonna come in next. The test scores um, for until 2024 spring, we are test optional. Um, so that is good news for all of you that are juniors. Next year, we're, we're waiting for SUNY to kind of make that final decision about after that, what's going to be happening. Um, there's also supplemental materials at some of the other campuses. Some of them have special talent review like Binghamton, where you may have to submit your talent um, for consideration as well. Just to kind of give you some things to keep in mind with the application deadlines, every campus is a little bit different. Um, <coughs> Binghamton is an early action. There are some schools in SUNY that have early decision. The difference between early action and early decision is one is binding and they want you to withdraw your applications from other campuses. Early action, you have until that May 1st to make the decision. You just hear early from us as far as when the decision is. So for us, our early action deadline is November 1st. You have to apply. You'll hear from us by January 15th and then you have until May 1 to make that decision. With early decision, you're saying, you know, I really wanna to go to that school. I'm making that commitment and I'll um, only apply to one school with early decision. Then regular consideration, you apply by January 15th for us. Um, and each SUNY campus has a little bit slightly different deadlines and you wanna kind of take a look at each one to see what they're looking at. Um, and then you'll hear from us by April 1st as far as the decisions. Hey, um, um, Janae. Yes. We no we're noticing that uh, your slide, it's still on that first Binghamton picture. Oh dear. Um, yeah. I am so sorry. No, that's okay. So um, I'm we're, I think we're all following them very well, but it, okay. you know what you were saying was I'm yep. sure matching up to a slide. It was indeed, and I apologize for that. <laughs> that's um, okay. <laughs> I'm not. Sh I'm gonna end that show. And uh, are you seeing my screen now with the? Yes. With yep. Okay. Yep. Um, Absolutely. Okay. So now you're just seeing the the regular PowerPoint that I have. Um, but yep. some, just some things to keep in mind with the school selection, um, kind of keep a list of the things that are most important to you. Um, I love the idea of having the folders and the spreadsheets, um, uh, because I think that as you look at different campuses, um, you'll get a different feel and a good different sense. Um, I, you know, I did not say about myself, but I am a Binghamton graduate, but I did not start at Binghamton. Um, I was a student who started somewhere because they gave me a significant scholarship. Um, and I thought, oh, this is perfect. I'm going to be at the top of the class at this school. I ended up being bored, um, to be honest with you. And it wasn't the right match. Um, although it would have been financially, it was a great fit. Um, it wasn't the right academic fit. And I encourage students to take a look and to see, you know, where you fit in the profile um, of those schools in terms of the academics and what students have to offer. You want some place that's going to challenge yourself. But you also want it to be a place that you're going to be able to be successful. Um, and there are things that you can look at to, to kind of get a gauge a sense of what that means. 
um, you know, re student retention. So what, how many students are retained from first year to second year um, and whether students are, are enjoying themselves at those campuses. Um, so I do think fit, you know, this isn't your first investment in yourself and in your future. Um, it's a big decision. The nice thing is in the United States, we have such flexibility of if you change your mind and something's not the right fit, you can make adjustments like I did. Um, and I ultimately loved going to Binghamton. It was the best campus decision for me. Um, really great, amazing opportunities. Um, it's okay to be broad. I think a lot of students think that they have to pick a major right when they're looking. Um, but you want to know, you know, if, if there are different opportunities at the campus for you if you change your mind. Because honestly, students on average change their mind about three or four times while they're in college. It's very normal. Um, some students come in and they have that pathway and they know this is what I'm going to do. Other students, like I said, will change that mind. Um, so you want to have those opportunities to kind of look and to see what the school has to offer. Certainly look at specialized programs and majors. I know we talked about test being test optional, um, and you do have that option. If you are looking at early assurance programs, for instance, with Upstate Medical, they are going to require that you take the SAT. Um, and as I said, undecided is not a bad thing. I think I, a lot of students think that they um, need that decision right away. And looking and exploring the opportunities really give you a lot of choices. <coughs> it also really allows you the flexibility to see things that you may not have seen before and to tailor. So we have students at Binghamton that, for instance, that will create their own degree and kind of come up with a major that meets their needs and their interests. We also have student, a lot of students that do double majors. So, um, and they wouldn't necessarily have done that if they hadn't explored and tried some different classes to see what's gonna write, be the right fit for them. And then last but not me, last but not least, I certainly encourage you to kind of look at specialized programs and to see what opportunities there are. For those of you who've really challenged yourself, those honors programs are going to be very important for you. You want to explore those options um, and to see what they have available. When you look, I also want you to be realistic in those special programs. So if Binghamton, for instance, our average student coming in, the mid 50% of students coming in have between a 93 to a 98 GPA. Um, so 25% are going to be higher than a 98 and 25% are going to be low, lower than a 93. Um, if you're looking at some of these specialized programs, you've got to be in that top 5% of our incoming applicant pool. Um, you've got to be realistic in terms of what we're looking for for those special programs. So you want to ask those questions to say, okay, what, what is your special program looking for? And to kind of gauge the, the interest and to see if it's something that's going to be the right fit for you. Stop my sharing here. Um, I hope that kind of covers a little bit more about what SUNY is and what we have to offer. And certainly I encourage you, one of the best ways to see if it's the right fit is by visiting. Um, and I encourage you to take notes when you're doing that visit and to see, um, you know, make sure you can remember the things that are most important to you as you do that visit. Thank you. We have a, we actually have a question here in the chat. Can you tell us more about the resources SUNY provides for seeing if credits transfer? We have a lot of students who take um, high school credit uh, courses, but they also are tied to uh, specific colleges as well. Yep. Um, actually, we have some with SUNY. We have some with Siena here at Gilderland. So, um, yep. so uh, SUNY, but, SUNY's yep. exceptionally good about accepting transfer credits. Um, we want students to have the best experiences and to bring in. Um, we know that you worked hard for those credits. So typically from high school and SUNY, as long as you have a SEER bettered from an accredited school, so, and you get that transcript into us, it is going to be acceptable. Um, you can look actually in advance to see, does it meet a SUNY general education requirement or does it meet a uh, more elective credits? It just depends on the course. Uh, many of us have websites right on our admissions page that link you to the most frequently transferred in courses. Um, so you can kind of look in advance to say, oh, this class from Siena is gonna come in, it's uh, going to count as my English composition class. Um, so you're not wasting your time in that in that course. You know it's going to come in before you even sign up for it for next year. We also are very generous in terms of AP, IB, and in college level the college level courses, as I said. So, and if something is not listed on a website, any of the SUNY campus admissions offices would be happy to help you to know in advance if it's going to transfer in or not. I know I've had in the past, um, if I'm looking for that, like that AP scores and how it translates to college credit, we have a number of our students who take AP courses and, you know, a number of them get decent scores to transfer in. But even if you just click on the search bar, I find, and you just type in AP scores, it tends to link you to what that college's requirements are for transfer credit, which is helpful. Um, what about... Uh, 
Janae, do you have any information that you can share about which SUNY schools are the best for pre-med? Pre-med is a popular program. Yeah, so I would say that there are certainly um, different stats out there about pre-med um, that you can talk to each campus about. Um, you want to what you want to do is you want to ask what their acceptance rate is into medical school. You also want to know if they have early assurance type programs. So Binghamton has two different ones um, where students can apply and know that they're accepted into medical school before they're even uh, soft, going into their sophomore year. Um, so one of them is is where students actually apply directly from high school and they interview in that process in high school um, and know that they're accepted into medical school. Other programs require that you start that first year at Binghamton and then you get interviewed and in going into your sophomore year. Um, so you wanna just take a look and see as far as what their acceptance rates, their numbers are. Um, we typically have a, a pretty large cohort going on to medical school each year. <coughs> We're actually, I'm actually doing a presentation tomorrow night with Upstate Medical, um, talking to the, the students that are at Binghamton as sophomores um, about that opportunity for the early assurance program. And so with that program, um, it waives the MCAT for students. So it's a really good opportunity and program. So for those of you who don't know what the MCAT is, it's kind of like the SAT for medical school. Um, it allows you that entrance for medical school and um, it's a very competitive process, but it does get that wavy, waiver for students um, coming out of Binghamton. Um, I do know we are their, their number one feeder in terms of the volume of students going into um, medical schools um, for upstate medical where the, we send the most students um, than any other campus. Um, so, you know, it, I would encourage you certainly, um, the university centers tend to be the strongest in terms of the numbers, but that doesn't mean you can't get a great preparation at one of the other SUNY schools and there's lots of, of opportunities for students to go on for medical school from the different programs. It's just the volume of what they're used to working with is going to vary slightly. I hope they answered that question. Thank you. Hey, uh, Katie, I know uh, you have a number of students majoring in biology or there's the combined medical program um, that Sienna has. Can you speak that's to right. that? Because that's kind of related to, and it's not, you're not a SUNY school, but it is related to pre-med. Yeah, so we have um, three health professions advisors at the college. Um, each of them work with our students with different paths. Uh, we are a, one of three colleges that partner with Albany Medical College. Uh, we have an eight-year program, so you apply into it your senior year at Gilderland. You'd have automatic acceptance into Albany Med once you graduate from Siena. So it's an eight-year program, automatic acceptance, no MCATs taken. Um, you do need to have your SATs or ACTs for that program. So like Janae said, it's really important to do the research to know which programs require those test scores. Um, so that is with um, Albany Med. We also have articulations with LECOM. Um, LECOM, we have some accelerated programs with them. Again, early assurance programs that you'd apply into your senior year. And myself and my admissions team, we can walk you through the process. We also have some partnerships with SUNY Upstate as well. So there's a lot of different medical um, opportunities to, to pursue the medical degree um, for sure. But the Albany Med is, is the most popular one for students who are seniors applying into it. Thanks. Didn't want to take away from you, Janae, but I know that Sienna had uh, <laughs> had that that connection as well. Any other questions for Janae or Katie about SUNY schools or college admissions for private colleges or Sienna specifically or Binghamton uh, specifically? Please, you know please add into the chat, or if you wish to raise your hand, we'd be happy to answer those. Okay, all right. Well, thank you, ladies. We really appreciate uh, you know you participating and help, helping us out. You just provided so much information for our parents and students, and it's you know this is the the, the stuff that really makes a difference when you know trying to make all of these decisions. So thank you. All right, Steve, we need to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk about the exciting field of financial aid and how all of this uh, college business gets paid for and, and what students and parents can do in, in preparing now as juniors and uh, parents of juniors, students uh, this year and then, you know, following into the senior year. Uh, sure. Yeah. Let me just pull up. I uh, have a little PowerPoint presentation here. Hold on a second while I pull it up. Can everyone see this, the financial aid? Hopefully, yes. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so really the start of it, uh, as Katie and Janae have talked about, is a, finding out what college you want to apply to and applying to those colleges. We can't, um, we can't, um, uh, you know, give you a financial aid decision unless you've applied and been accepted. Um, the first real step in the process, again, you know, is filing and getting accepted. Then it's called filing the, the FAFSA form, the free application for federal student aid. Um, it opens up on October 1st of each year. So really it's, we're only like what, eight months away from this it's opening up because you'll be filing for the 24, 25 academic year, and you'll be using 2022 tax information that you're doing right now for that. Um, you go to studentaid.gov to do that. Um, most people sign the FAFSA form electronically. So you'll create what's called an FSA user ID and password. Uh, the student needs to complete that as well as a parent because one parent will need to sign the FAFSA form. And most people do the FAFSA form electronically. You can do it um, you know, by paper form. You can print the paper form out, fill it out, but it's much easier and faster to do. About 99% of FAFSA forms go in electronically. Um, in the FAFSA form itself, it's going to ask you lots of different questions. And I'll put in a, a caveat here. You're going to be f the first of a lucky group of people that will, will file the FAFSA form and they're going to simplify it in 2425. They're really going to cut down on the questions. Currently, there's about 100 different questions on there. Most of them are demographic, but some are, um, you know, about your tax information. But uh, with the simplification process, it's going to really cut down on that. Um, you can use what's called when you file the, the FAFSA form, they call the IRS data retrieval. By entering in some information, the FAFSA form will, will gather information from the IRS and send it over to the FAFSA form to make it easier for you. Um, if that process doesn't work or you don't want to use it, don't worry. Um, on the FAFSA form, it's going to ask for a different set of information, and it's going to tell you where to go on your tax form to find that information. And again, no college's deadlines and meet them. Um, again, because um, as my daughter, my oldest daughter is going to college next year, we created a spreadsheet of all the different colleges that she was applying to. And we put on, well, what was the date of the application was due? And then what was the date that they wanted the FAFSA form? So we made sure to file the FAFSA form as soon after October 1st as possible, but making sure that we met the deadline because you take the earliest FAFSA form. If you're applying to three different colleges and the earliest FAFSA form is December 1st, then you make sure that you hit that deadline. As long as you hit that deadline, all three will get that information. At the end of the FAFSA form, it's a great feeling. should take you about half an hour, 40 minutes to complete your first time. It's a great feeling, but you're not done yet. And the reason for that is uh, the state aid. It's called New York State TAP, the Tuition Assistance Program. You have to, at the end of the FAFSA form, there's a confirmation page. And then over on the right-hand side, it's going to say, do you want to complete your state application? You click that link and you go over and you complete the TAP application. You want to do it the same time as the FAFSA form. The TAP application should take you about another 20 minutes to complete. So in total, you're talking about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes of time to fill out both the FAFSA and the TAP applications. Next would be, again, some colleges do require additional information other than just the FAFSA form. One of the most um, common is what we call the CSS profile form, or they have their own institutional form. You can find out from either the college admissions or financial aid page if they require something other than the FAFSA form. The FAFSA form is free. However, the CSS profile is not. You would have to pay to get that information uh, sent to other colleges. Again, know the, the college's deadlines and meet them. Every college who gives out um, financial aid, federal financial aid, has a net, pr net price calculator on their website. So what you can do now is you can go in and put in your information uh, that the college requires, some basic federal tax information, and it's going to give you an estimate of what they think you're going to pay at that college. Again, it's as good as the information that you put in, but it will give you an idea of what you might receive from that college in college scholarships or grants, um, federal financial aid, federal grants, federal work study, federal loans, and an estimate of what we think your New York State TAP the tuition assistance program might be. 
Some common questions we get on the FAFSA form. We don't think we'll qualify for financial aid. Should we still file the FAFSA form? The answer to that question is yes. You don't know what you're going to qualify for until you actually apply for it. Um, it's a free form. Takes you, again, about 40 minutes. Would tap about an hour's worth of time. You don't know what you qualify for until you do it. Um, some questions students will ask, well, do I need to provide my parents information? The answer to that question is yes. Um, until the student is the age of 24, they're married, they have dependents, they're a veteran, they're an orphan award of the court, or they're a graduate student. It's going to be students' income and assets and parents' income and assets as well. Another question is, if, if, my, if my parents aren't uh, married anymore, who do I choose? Uh, we say whoever provides more than half support for, for you. So if I live and uh, my mother supports me more than half time, then that's who I put on the FAFSA form. Um, you can change it. So let's say in my first year, it's my mom, but let's say in my second year, it's my dad, then I put my dad in on the FAFSA form for my second year at school. I will also say that the FAFSA form takes a look at the new family unit. So let's just say I'll take it that I was living with my mom and she provides more than half my support. But if she's remarried, my mom's information, my stepdad's information, and my information would have to go on the FAFSA form. Um, what do you provide for the value? Do you put on the your value of retirement or pension funds in the asset section of the question of the FAFSA form? No, you do not. You do not report those on the FAFSA form. Once you do file the FAFSA form, you're going to get what's called a student aid report. Again, it just tells you everything that you filed on that FAFSA form. Keep it for your records. Um, you know, we get a, by putting on a school code, you can put up to 10 different school codes on a FAFSA form. As long as the school code's on there, we'll get that information electronically. You do not need to send it to us. Uh, we do now see that STEM students are applying to more than 10 different colleges. So what do you do in that case? Well, you file the FAFSA form with those 10 different colleges. So let's just say I'm applying to 12 colleges. You, you file with the first 10 on the FAFSA form. Once it's filed, you wait about three days and then you go back in and you add two, you take two schools off and you put the two new schools on by putting on their school codes. And that will ensure that all 12 got the information from the FAFSA form. Hey, Steve. Yes. So when you mention um, 12 schools, you take, you wait the three days, you know, is there something that's on your student aid report that you would know you're in the clear that you can take a couple of colleges off and then, and then if add you, a couple on? Yeah, you should just wait three days. If you try to go back in too early, it won't let you go back in. The FAFSA would say unavailable at the present moment. Okay, uh, so that would be wait. your clue that you couldn't go in. Correct. It would just, it would then tell you. Wait, you. You'd wait another day. But if you, usually okay. it only takes about a data process usually gotcha usually unless there's some issue okay we do have a couple of questions um sure. how will the upcoming changes to the fafsa affect multiple children in college at the same time that's a great question and we're still waiting for answers on that but <laughs> from 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 the guidance that i know that we have um <clears throat> there you're going to get instead of instead you're going to get an, an index it won't matter how many children are in college it's, you know, so right now, if a student received what they call the Pell Grant, which I'll go and talk about in a few minutes, that's the biggest federal grant that's out there. You might get it in your first year. Let's say that you had, you had um, a brother or sister in college, another child in college, you might get it one year. But what happens is when they leave, so in your first year, you get it, but then in your second year, you're the only one in college, you might lose that Pell Grant. Um, they're going to change to what's called like an index number. And based on that index number, you get a Pell Grant. It wouldn't matter if you had one brother in college, zero brother or zero uh, other siblings in college or 10, you're still going to get a Pell Grant based on that. Um, they haven't really shared the whole formula with us yet or they haven't finalized it yet. And it's coming this summer. Okay. So um, what they tell us is, is that more people will qualify for a Pell Grant now than what did before. So we'll oh. have to wait. We'll wait and see. We'll, we'll, we'll wait, wait and see. see. Here's see. another question that came through. Um, do we have to fill out FAFSA every year for college or only if there is a change in the household? Uh, you have to file the FAFSA form each year. So you'll be doing the okay. FAFSA form four different times for each of your years okay. in college. And same with New York State TAP. You'll be filing a New York State TAP each year. Okay, thanks. It gets easier, I can tell you. It, it does get easier once you once you get through it. The next thing I'll say too is uh, 
you know, students and parents should do the FAFSA form together. This is not the first or last form you're ever going to fill out. It's your college education. Uh, it, you know, it's your aid. Um, so you need to make sure that you, you know, you, you fill it out, you know, have, you know, do it with your parents. It's, it, it's really important. Um, for the most part, I'll tell you, I know I'm in financial aid, but I made my daughter do it. You know, we did it a couple of weeks after October 1st. I was there for support, but she did the FAFSA form and it, it did. It took us, it took her about 40 minutes to get through it. And then about another 10 to 15 minutes to do the TAP application. And I can also tell you, you don't have to finish it in one sitting. You could save it or you come up with a question. What do you do? Like you don't know how to answer a question. You know, there's some great help features in the FAFSA form, but you just don't know. You can always send a message to one of the kind guidance counselors and they can contact one of us in financial aid. Or, um, you know, I'll give this um, pre presentation. I'll, I'll send it over and it has my contact information. Just send me a just send me an email. I can help you or give me a phone. I'll give you a phone call. Don't need to apply to the College of St. Rose to do that. I'd be more than happy to help get it, whatever question answered and get forms filed in a timely manner. So I guess I'll go back to the presentation. Are there any, were there any more questions in the chat? In the tech? No, not, not at this time. Okay. So then once you file, once you file the FAFSA form, um, you're going to get a financial aid package. It's going to include any scholarships you might've gotten from the college, whether it be academic, whether it be athletic, um, science, music, art, however the college deemed to give out that aid, that scholarship would be on that award letter. Grants such as the New York State TAP grant, New York State students going to New York State schools based on income might receive a grant to help you pay for college. The federal Pell grant we were talking about, again, the, the largest one out there. Um, any other college grants that might be out there? Um, other colleges give if, um, grants off based off the FAFSA form or the CSS profile or their own institutional application. Some colleges participate in what they, we call the Federal Teach Grant Program. We do here at St. Rose. I know there are some SUNY schools that do as well. It's for teachers working in high income fields uh, in um, uh, low economic uh, high schools. Again, they call it a grant, but you have to view it as a loan because of the fact that uh, it is there, if you don't complete the service component, it does turn into a loan. Um, you may also receive what we call federal work study where you'd work on campus and get paid for the number of hours that you receive. It doesn't come off the bill, but it's a fiscal paycheck to try to help the student pay for those other expenses while in college. And then federal loans. Uh, this year, uh, you can see the federal Pell Grant ranges from, if you qualify from about almost $6,900 down to almost $700. There's also something called the federal SEOG grant. SEOG grants go out to the neediest students, which are deemed Pell Grant students. Every college receives a different, a different amount. We don't normally get enough money to cover all of our Pell Grant students, but the Pell Grant or the SEOG grant can range from $100 up to $4,000. $4,000 is the maximum. Then the maximum teach grant, if you're a full-time for a year, for this year would be about almost almost thirty eight hundred dollars um, if you decided to do that. New York State tap ranges from about fifty seven hundred down to five hundred. The next two are what we call uh, the Excelsior Scholarship Program to New York State. Uh, that's the free tuition. If you qualify based on income, um, you potentially could have your tuition paid for at a SUNY or CUNY school. What you'd be responsible for are any fees and room and board if you lived on campus. And I also put the the um, the website to go to through New York State to look that up. And again, you would subtract federal Pell Grant or TAP to receive the Excelsior Scholarship. But the combination of the Excelsior Scholarship, Pell and TAP, if you receive them, would cover your tuition. Then uh, there is, it's called the ETA or the Enhanced Tuition Award. Some private colleges, St. Rose being one of them, participate in this program. You could get up to $6,000. It's a combination. You subtract out the TAP grant. So if you didn't get a TAP grant, but you got the ETA, your Enhanced Tuition Award is $6,000. Uh, half comes from the state of New York and half would come from the college. And again, you go to the same website to learn more about that. The great thing about this one is you can put in your email address. These won't show up on 
or actually maybe Janae can help me with this one on SUNY, but I don't believe the Excelsior shows up on the first award letter you receive because you can't apply for these until May or June. I know with the enhanced tuition award, we put them on an award letter, but it would be after May 1st, like once the applications op uh, open up. But is Janae still on the call? I, I am. I jumped on and put the camera back on. So um, every SUNY campus is a little bit different in the way that they handle the Excelsior. Some will do an estimate that you're eligible, um, like an anticipated amount. Binghamton does not do that on ours. We wait until you've been a recipient and, and receive that. Um, it is um, the way that New York State works, the Excelsior is, it is a last chance in terms of um, the way that they apply it. So we wait and see um, what's going to happen with that scholarship okay. before we put it, the award on. Yeah. Thank you, Janae. I appreciate that. I know because we participate in the ETA, we don't put it on the, we don't put it on. We um, include information in the financial aid award that would say, if you do qualify, here's the amount you qualify for, uh, but it wouldn't be on the award letter. And you can always talk to one of us, one of the financial aid counselor here, and we can help you with that. Then federal loans, uh, first year student going to school can borrow up to $5,500 through the federal staffer loan program. Um, we don't know what the interest rate is going to be because it changes after July 1st, but currently it's 4.99% fixed with a 1.069 origination fee. These loans you don't need to repay until six months after you graduate or drop below halftime status. Um, then you, parents do have the option to take out what we call a, a federal parent plus loan. You can borrow up to the cost of education minus any other grants or loans that, uh, you know, that the student receives. And again, um, it changes every July 1st. So right currently it's 7.54% fixed, but um, you know what I mean? It's going to be different when, once you start to enter college because um, it will get set, you know, by the federal government. And you can defer principal or principal and interest until after the student graduates or drops below halftime status. But if you're not paying on the loan, it's um, accruing interest or it just takes you longer to pay it off. Then what you need to do is you need to sit down and once you get all your award letters and figure out, you know, these are the, my three colleges that I'm really interested in. Line up their costs, and the cost could be, you know, tuition and fees, room and board, or just tuition and fees if you're not living on campus. Then subtract out any grants or scholarships that you received. Then minus out the loans to figure out what is the net cost. But again, remember, with a loan, you may not be paying it now, but you'll be paying it off in the future. So you can see the, the comparison here where college A and college B, you know, relatively have the same net cost. But again, remember, college B has about $2,600 in loans. So um, just be careful and set that up um, so that you really know what, you, what you're paying for each school. And then don't, don't forget to apply for any scholarships, which you might be eligible for. You need to reapply each year uh, for the FAFSA and the TAP applications. And then again, the FAFSA is just a snapshot in time and we're using two years back. So especially now with the pandemic, you know, if there've been changes to your income, you need to file the FAFSA form as your tax, as that tax year happens, but then you'd contact a financial aid administrator like myself on a college campus. And we might be able with the prep, proper documentation, be able to take out. So let's just say in what, in the year that we're looking at, I got a lot of overtime because I, you know what I mean? Someone was out sick and, you know, I, I just got a lot of overtime because it was just busy and I had to work a lot. We might be able to take out that overtime pay and, and, and increase your financial need and maybe get you another type of federal or institutional aid. And again, some, some useful websites, studentaid.gov, uh, hess.ny.gov, that's where you file the TAP application, and they have great other resources there as well. Fastweb.com and finaid.org are good scholarship search engines. And with that, I'm just wondering if anyone else has any questions. Thank you. I actually have a quick question. So sure. um, many of our students are going to be living on campus. You know, they're going to live in a dorm. They're going to have the meal plan. Um, in addition to obviously paying for tuition, does financial aid cover um, housing and meal plans? It can. Yes, it can. So what you'll do is you'll take whatever your build fees are. So tuition and fees. And then if you decide to live on campus room and board, then you subtract any of the scholarships you might receive. Um, like any scholarship you might receive from the from the college, federal federal grants, um, federal loans, federal parent loans, you know that can help you cover your tuition fees and room and board. What I can say is some colleges might give you some aid 
for like mm-hmm. living on campus. So they might have like a residence grant, let's just say. So they may and not they know whether you're living on or off campus, but let's just say they gave you a financial aid decision that said residence grant. I bet if you didn't live on campus, you're not going to get that residence grant. And again, that's a good thing to ask. So when you when you narrow it down to your you know final, I would say two or three choices, ask that college, am I going to receive this financial aid for you know my four years here? Um, do I need to keep a certain GPA requirement to keep this? Um, do I need to stay in a certain major? Like you might've gotten like a science scholarship, let's just say, but if you decide, you know what, science really isn't for me and I want to go into English, you know, would you lose any of that? Those would be the, some of the important questions to ask. Also, if I receive an outside scholarship, does, you know, how does that affect my financial aid decision? Every college can do it differently because it's, you know, every college just does it. What we do is I'm just going to give the example. Um, you know, let's just say a family had to pay $5,000 and they got a $2,000 scholarship. We let the 2000 go against the $5,000 that they owe, so they'd only owe us three. That doesn't mean another college doesn't do it a different way. They may take it off the loans that have been offered. They may take it off a grant that was offered. So, it, like I said, that would be another important question to ask of how do you treat outside resources? So when that family um, gets the uh, that financial aid package mm-hmm. from however many colleges, um, you know, after they filed the FAFSA Mm -hmm. and they've applied to the school, they've gotten accepted. So it could, it would list grants, scholarships, which Mm -hmm. I like to say, that's the free money. That's the stuff you don't have to pay back. So we like that. Mm -hmm. And then if it has any loans, now you, families and students have a choice. They don't have to, they can say, okay, we're going to take the grants (laughs) and the scholarship money, but maybe we're going to opt not to borrow. So you can, you can kind of pick and choose, right. On your, on your Absolutely. financial aid package. Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. Are pretty much, pretty much all of them will be somewhat standard to that. Again, yep. it will show you your tuition fees and then room and board. And then, like you said, it'll take away your grants and scholarships and then it would show loans after that. So you'd know what you'd be paying after the grants and scholarships. And then you could see, well, after the federal student loan, what would I owe? You might also receive a financial aid decision from a college that might have what's called the parent plus loan already put in there. So, let's just say it was $15,000 after all grants and scholarships to go, you know, to live on campus, they might put in a parent plus loan to fill that difference, that $15,000 difference. Uh, But a parent has to go through a credit check, you know, and not, you know, not everyone's always approved, but you could get it just because it's not on a financial aid decision doesn't mean you can't borrow a parent plus loan. You know, other ways to cope. I always say colleges always have payment plans where you can set up a payment plan either over usually what four or five months, you know, each semester you can do a payment plan. And I say, even if you can't do the full amount, let's say you can only do $600 a month for five months, do that first. And then maybe you have to take the parent plus loan to bridge that gap, you know, so do always try to do a payment plan first, if you can. Um, Also, there are such things called as like private. So like parent plus loans are one avenue, something called like a private alternative loan to like a private bank or private lending institution. Student has to be 18 with a co-signer, you know, usually a parent or family member. Um, but again, just be careful that some offer variable rates, some offer fixed rates. You know what I mean? You just have to be, you just have to be careful on those. But again, that's something once you get the financial aid decision that you can make an appointment with anyone. I know Binghamton, Siena, myself, you know what I mean? Whatever college you're applying to, you can sit down either phone, in person, Zoom to talk to the financial aid officer about what was offered on that award letter to you, financial aid package. You know, what does it mean? What does this loan mean? You know, what are my options to pay it? All those questions I was talking about, you can go over. And if you feel still feel it's out of reach for you, you can always potentially based on the college's policy, right? Maybe write in an appeal letter and see if you can't get additional aid to help you with, you know, to help you maybe get a little bit more dollars to make that affordable for you and your family. That's the, uh, my policy is uh, the worst thing you're going to hear is no. (laughs) Correct. And doesn't hurt to ask. It's a little bit different. They may have, you know, some may have out there, like we don't do appeals other than a change in income. Other right. colleges may say, you know what, write it in, you know, tell me, like I wasn't able to put on that I was helping, you know, let's say a grandparent, you know, an assistant living facility, you know, there's some, some of my income's going there. There could be different things like a change in income. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. again, the FAFSA form in these are just a snapshot in time. Doesn't mean it's what you're actually taking home in income today. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. That's excellent. I don't think we have any more questions in the chat. If anybody has any last minute questions that they wish to ask, this would be the time. Um, Either enter in the chat, you can raise your hand. 
Uh, like I said earlier, uh, we are meeting with families and um, we have, uh, uh, somebody mentioned the college fair that's coming up in March. So that'll be at Gilderland High School. Then in April, there's the Hudson Valley uh, college regional uh, college fair, the regional one. So a little bit bigger than the one that's at our high school. So these are all really great uh, things for students to to go to, and like um, and like what we've heard tonight. You know, go up to Katie. You know, hi Katie. I was at the you know this event or that event, or I visited your campus. You know, um, Steve. I don't know. Do you do college fairs or do you? Um, I do. I do not. I you know okay. I don't. Those are more for the admissions side. The admissions, right? The admission side, but yeah. Same idea. There, you know, we want students to talk to those admissions counselors. You know, we we always have the the SUNY system is always strong at our college fair. So uh, we want students and parents to fill out those postcards or any of that information to get on the mailing list. So that's really important. And then make a plan to visit. So that's that's our hope for our students and parents for this spring and going into the summer. Um, okay. So uh, thank you again. We really appreciate your time, your questions. This was wonderful. Um, we just learned so much information. I, I know this has been, it's personally helpful to me and um, I know it's been helpful to all who've attended. So we really appreciate, appreciate your time and attention. Thanks. Great. Thank Have you. Have a great night. Thank you. Okay, take care. We appreciate you having this. Oh, great.